Well, good morning. This is the Lou Rockwell Show, and what an honor it is to have as our guest this morning, Dr. Ron Paul. Now, what do we say about Dr. Paul? You know, I could do the entire show just talking about his qualifications, but I'll just say that he's the leader of the worldwide freedom movement and has been for uh, for many years. Uh, he's the man that people look to in this country and all over the world uh, for guidance on libertarian principle and libertarian tactics. And uh, he's involved in many wonderful things, the Ron Paul Homeschool Curriculum, uh, the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity. And Ron, thinking about the issue of peace, there's an organization called the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, and they uh, have a clock, a doomsday clock, as they call it, and they set the hands to sort of see from foreign policy questions how close things are to doomsday. And they've recently moved the hand closer to the doomsday point because they're concerned that the chances of atomic warfare uh, are worse than they used to be. Uh, what's your feeling about that? Well, let's hope he's they're wrong. <laughs> you know, uh, and it may may be true. Sometimes when you think that they de-escalated, actually things are getting worse because, uh, you know, when the Cold War was very hot, the Soviets had a lot of missiles uh, armed and ready to shoot. And, of course, we did. And, and uh, people were very much aware of it. But it was also known that there would be massive retaliation, so neither side uh, used them. So now things are supposed to be a little bit calmed down. But I don't think... Uh, yeah, I don't think it's the weapons that we have to work, but there are a lot of weapons. And even if you don't use atomic weapons, they're still, you know, a major problem. So I think what, what we've done is we've adapted to a foreign policy, which I think is very, very dangerous, you know, because we're involved so much and people have grown to resent us. And, and, and if, if we ever get knocked down a notch or two, I've always believed that there would be some piling on. So if we look weak, uh, and our actually cannot uh, re- retaliate. I think, uh, and we lose a few of these. I think people will pile on because uh, right now we're a kingpin, you know, militarily and financially. But how long will the dollar be the kingpin? You know, it uh, it may get knocked down, and I wouldn't be surprised if we're much closer to an economic uh, tragedy as well as a military. Although I do not foresee. You know, wars like World War One and World War Two. I think they're going to be massive and vicious and violent, and maybe for this reason, uh, the scientists are arguing maybe even more dangerous because we don't know exactly where all the nuclear weapons are. You know, they're worrying about a weapon a country doesn't have. You know, Iran, and uh, yet there are a lot of weapons that. Maybe they should be paying attention to, you know, that our allies have. I mean, there's a lot of weapons in the Middle East, uh, both on the so-called West and the other countries. Both Israel and Pakistan have nuclear weapons. The Russians have nuclear weapons. Indians have nuclear weapons. And there are a lot of leftover weapons. And uh, whether uh, the Russians have total control of all the weapons the Soviet system left, uh, I don't know if anybody really knows that. But I imagine that still poses a danger. But I think war comes from ec- for economic reasons, and and that's where things are getting worse worldwide. I think we're ready to turn down, uh, you know, even the economy to turn down, and then that's when countries so often, it's built into their genetics that, well, when things are bad, that's distracting. Besides, war is good for the economy. So I think under those conditions, uh, we should be very concerned about some major military outbreak. And of course, Ron, as you pointed out, sanctions are an act of war, uh, so that the U.S. is piling more and more sanctions on uh, Russia. They've already got a lot on Iran uh, and, and other countries. And this makes other <laughs> makes the other country uh, very unhappy. I mean, if you think of sort of the general principles of diplomacy, uh, you don't want to push the opposing guy against the wall because surprises can take place. Right. The unintended consequences. And I guess the thing that amazes me is why Europe is so willing to be uh, pushed around. But they've been dependent on us. We've been the economic powerhouse, and uh, we help rebuild their countries after World War II. So they are rather dependent on, on our, our military. But uh, now we're putting these sanctions and really, really uh, putting it to the Russians and to Putin. It seems like it would be my guess that many Europeans are very reluctant. People themselves might not be so anxious to see the confrontation, and there's business people and banks probably not. But when it comes to the leadership of the European Union and the leaders of NATO and, and, and our influence over there, they're all for pushing this conflict. But 
I think the sanctions on Russia will eventually hurt us as much as anybody because I work under the assumption that there's a very good chance that, that we colluded with Saudi Arabia in order to punish Russia and drive these prices down, but it looks like it might be the precipitating event uh, for our next major turn down in this country because in this uh, great state of Texas where jobs have been very very numerous and it's been a very healthy economy, people are starting to talk about, you know, a, a downturn and thousands of people are being laid off. And I don't think any of those jobs that uh, have been uh, eliminated have been factored into the system yet. And and then there's also these ramifications. So I think the sanctions, although they're, uh, they precipitate anger and frequently lead to war, look how many years we had sanctions on Iraq until finally, you know, the bigger war came because it, it doesn't satisfy the goals, we may well suffer a lot more than anybody anticipated. And even if, uh, you know, if they have their war like the neocons would like, uh, I think that that would be tragic and, uh, it, and nothing good could come from it. These sanctions just always impress me among other problems of just being sadistic. In fact, I can't think of any example in history where a country actually gave in to sanctions and said, OK, we're going to stop doing, you know, whatever the hegemon doesn't want us to do. In, in general, they just hunker down and they don't... Uh, they don't change their ways, either for good or bad. Matter of fact, I think it does the opposite. So if you have dissenters in Iran uh, and then you put on sanctions, people by their very nature unify. You know, if we're attacked by foreigners and, uh, and, and you know, have a 9-11, you know, Republicans and Democrats come together because we see it as a foreign source. So this undermines the dissidents in these countries. But the two areas, as a matter of fact, the neocons claim the sanctions have done this wonderful good because that is what brought them to the table. Yet at the same time, many neocons say we don't even want to talk to them. But uh, I don't I don't believe that they do achieve uh, anything. I mean, if if ISIS can uh, get the oil out of the ground, package it up and sell it and get millions of dollars to run their uh, run their so-called uh, quasi government and fight these wars. I mean, uh, how the sanctions don't seem to be, you know, uh, may, uh, you know, a tremendous success. Also, they uh, have always used South Africa as as an example where sanctions made the difference. But I think there are some uh, geopolitical and social social uh, changes that occurred there that made that come about. But they won't give up. Uh, they have to feel good about it. I was always uh, annoyed with it in Congress because we had an anti-war unofficial group, uh, the few libertarian Republicans, and then uh, generally the Black Caucus and other others did not. Uh, they're, they're really against war because they want all that money to go to food stamps for people here. But when it when it came to sanctions, it was they just could never vote against sanctions because that would prevent war. And uh, they 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 wanted to look tough and they would go along with it. They'd go along with the sanctions, uh, but uh, never get the results that they thought they were going to get. Ron, there are uh, all kinds of inter interesting things happening as usual. With the uh, international monetary questions. We had the Swiss uh, unpeg the Swiss franc to the euro. We have the dollar going up in value against the euro, the euro plummeting. Then we have the Greek situation. Give us your observations on what's happening in that area. Well, what we're witnessing is instability. The whole financial system is unstable, but it was from the very beginning. And we're just getting to see this from happening because there's only fiat currencies out there. And they claim, well, we'll link it to the euro or we'll, the IMF will smooth things out as they did under Bretton Woods. But there's always people who want to get an advantage so they have competitive devaluations. Uh, so it's ironic that we have printed these uh, trillions and trillions of dollars, which means the dollar has to be uh, weak, uh, you know, in the long term, and yet now it's considered a very, very strong currency, which says that uh, the rest of the currencies must be in shambles. But I think it just represents instability. It's completely opposite of what it would be like if uh, currencies were linked to gold. Uh, we would eliminate all that instability. Uh, there would still be cheaters, and you'd have to watch uh, watch out for the countries that do, but they, you know, they would be punished for it. But when it's, when it's universal, when you have the 
euro, you know, with so many countries in, involved in, uh, in in defending the euro, uh, you, you know, it's very painful. But I think what we're seeing though, right now, not only a result of the competing devaluations, but also the excessive debt that comes from inflation and uh, the weak spots, of course, will be Italy and, and Greece and Spain and these countries that are really insolvent and they should go bankrupt. The debt should be liquidated. We should have a better monetary policy for us as well as them. But that's not going to happen because they're going to do their very best to what, exactly what we did when uh, we should have gone through the correction, which will eventually come and be much worse. But uh, no, they uh, they propped the system up so that the uh, people holding the debt, which are the bankers uh, and holding sovereign debt, and uh, this this recent change. Uh, uh, with the with the euro, uh, they said they can buy sovereign debt now. They have their own QE, and they're allowed to buy sovereign debt. I think you'll remember when we talked about that in the early '80s. They were changing, yes. you know, uh, the agreement so our Fed could buy that. And they didn't start buying the very first week, but they ended up buying plenty in this last go around with that 17 trillion dollars of, of bailout. And and I think people can rest assured that uh, the debate in uh, on, on the euro and what's happening in Europe is not solely a European matter. I am sure I'd be betting that uh, the Federal Reserve is very much involved because right now people are using the dollar and it's their interest to make use of that dollar as long as they can. But uh, when it comes, and if, we, if we help bail out the banks before and sovereign nations, you know, in 08 and 09, we'll, we'll do it again. But there's, there's always this wheeling and dealing who gets the most punishment and uh, I've always uh, assumed that the, the euro would not be successful. And I kept thinking about what Mises, uh, you know, about the idea of origin of money. It has to be natural and it has to be from the market. And I often thought, well, the dollar is fiat, but it originated as a sound currency and has sort of been coasting on its laurels. But what about the euro? It, does the euro deserve even that token amount of, uh, of support? And it looked and I thought it would be a failure rather quickly because I thought it was a brand new fiat currency out of thin air. And it looks right now more like that. But I'm also convinced that bringing Europe together, whether it's with a monetary unit or a political unit, I don't do, I just don't believe they'll have a political unit. I mean, libertarianism could bring people together if they would fear, if they would uh, follow the non-aggression principle, people could come and trade out and, and trade and, and, and do things like this and it would work. But when you have a political unit, I don't think uh, it's easy to get the Spanish, the Italians and, and the Greeks and the French and the British and the Germans all together and say, oh yeah, we'll, we'll work together. This out, uh, and I don't. I think it's going very badly now. So uh, we can expect, uh, you know, lots of turmoil in the markets in, in the next, uh, next, next week and next year, and and so on until they clean up the mess. Ron, as you indicate, there may be some secession going on in the European Union, and just recently we were honored to have you as uh, the chief speaker at the Mises Circle in Houston to talk about secession, and you got. Two huge standing ovations and a, just a continuous applause. But there was one guy there who wasn't applauding. He was a Washington Post reporter who seemed outraged that anybody would be discussing secession, let alone in a positive way. He just thought uh, it, was a t- it was a terrible thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you, you, you said, no, it's not a terrible thing. And it absolutely is something that can be discussed, should be discussed. And uh, if people want it, should be implemented. Yeah. And my position is not adamant because I've uh, when they ask me what do you think about Texas because people there are people here obviously would like to separate from the United States and I can understand their argument but I don't take that position uh, in in a specific way because I figured you know if you if we left the union right now uh, I know what kind of clowns we have in, in Austin <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I'm cautious but to me it's the principle you you know it's sort of like 
principle of drugs is that you make your choices. I don't defend the drug itself. So lots of things could, you know, be good or bad as the outcome. But the principle of the right to leave, you know, uh, I think is so important. But, you know, words sometimes are used against us. And as a matter of fact, I think it's uh, sad that they've taken secession and they've twisted that. And if you say, I am a secessionist, you know, you know what they do to us. They, they paint us. Uh, badly. But in my talk at the Mises Institute, I tried to point out that, um, you know, that means if you're not for uh, the right of secession and separation, that means you like the Soviet Union. You could never leave the Soviet Union. That means you like us being part of the British Empire and we should never leave. But I think the words I like to use is, you know, self-determination. People have a right to uh, self, uh, you know, decide what they want and to leave another another body uh, if they want. And uh, this this to me is is important that uh, we never accept the notion that uh, one group should be forced to uh, live with another group. I think uh, I've, I've said that uh, you know an agreement, maybe a voluntary agreement, might have occurred if if uh, the United States and Europe and NATO wasn't in a battle with Russia over Ukraine. Maybe the civil war in Ukraine would come up with maybe not total destruction, elimination of Ukraine, but maybe you know an agreement. Well, we'll have West Ukraine and East Ukraine, and we'll trade and talk and 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 be friends, but we still be be Ukrainians. And uh, so I think um, it, it, you know instead of saying that the East Ukrainians want to separate, why uh, why can't we say that the West Ukrainians, all they want to do is separate themselves, you know, and be independent. But no, they twist it and uh, make it sound terrible. And I think uh, self-determination, no violence being used, uh, uh, self, you know, independence, and, and, and uh, the idea that uh, it, it that we can still have loose federations of groups coming together. But uh, just think that if these people, you know, have a lick of courage or understanding or any wisdom at all, they're taking the position that we shouldn't decolonialize Africa. The foreign government should run these countries forever and ever, and that empire shouldn't end. Uh, so uh, I, I think it, it's, you know, in a way, it's, it's sort of a shame that we don't do a better job, but we're up against a huge, huge bureaucracy in the media, which twists us, and they have so much at stake, because I think most of what's going on in the debate today on foreign policy is to make sure that the foreign policy of us being over there when we we shouldn't be over there is they have to justify it uh, by uh, something uh, like, uh, well, well, they're militants, they're uh, very, very uh, violent people, and they only want to come here because we're free and prosperous. And uh, if they, if we ever won the argument and the American people said, no, uh, I think these libertarians just have, might have a point here. Uh, maybe they uh, are getting tired of us killing people and then just list how many people we've killed. You know, it's just atrocious. So that, but they'll turn around, oh, that meant you like Saddam Hussein. That means you like Putin and uh, all the controversies. No, it just means that uh, if you endorse this whole whole idea of us going over there uh, it, it is, is what they want. Most, most people uh, think that uh, the majority of American people think that uh, they're jihadists and they come here because we're free and prosperous. But the truth of it all slipped out of George Bush's mouth when he says, now that this has happened, we have to have a crusade against the Middle East. And um, he finally was tipped off that the, that the uh, Muslims and the Arabs of so the Middle East remember, you know, about the Crusades, uh, and uh, even though we in this country aren't too good on our history. <laughs> That's right. Well, Ron Paul, you know, I was, I was uh, one of your predecessors, Thomas Jefferson. I always liked his comment when he said uh, that it was important to stand with the states against the general government, with the counties against the states, with the towns against the counties, with the wards against the towns, but with the individual against all. That's it. And that's... Uh, 
If, That's a good if, advice, it seems to me, for today, too. Yeah. If, if people understood that, uh, they would endorse the ideas of, uh, of liberty because um, it's a very tolerant approach to things. If people use liberty with, with the rejection of the use of violence, it, it's pretty diverse. You know, if those people who preach diversity, understand, well, they probably understand it, but if they really wanted <laughs> diversity, I think it's libertarianism that is the only thing that offers it in a peaceful manner and let people do what they want with their lives, and they have to accept the responsibilities for everything that they do, but they also get to keep the rewards of their hard work and effort. Magnificent, Ron, and thanks so much for coming on the show today. It's always an inspiration and uh, an honor, so thank you. Great, Lou. Good to talk with you. Bye-bye. Well, thanks so much for listening to the Lou Rockwell Show today. Take a look at all the podcasts. There have been hundreds of them. There's a link on the LRC front page. Thank you.